uh, Your Holiness, Mrs. Prema Rangachari, Dr. Sriram. Uh, first of all, thank you very, very much um, for having me here, and thank you all for being here. It's a great honor and a privilege to be invited to come to this beautiful school in these beautiful surroundings. Um, also, the topic, peace and education, is something which you wouldn't find a less competent person to speak on. Um, I come from the turmoil of Delhi, and uh, education is not a strong point in bureaucratic circles. Um, so it's not clear what I can give here except to give my experiences. But let me first start by pointing out a rather positive aspect of uh, peace and education in no small measure helped by our bureaucracy. If you look at India's decades of independence, our record hasn't been all that bad. We tend to look upon our past as perfect, our present as imperfect, and our future as tense. But indeed, at any given time in the present, while we grapple with all the complexities of dealing with the day, we actually result in doing many good things, which in hindsight, we forget all the troubles we went through and we look at all the good things which have happened. So our education system post-independence in India, which had both states and the central government being responsible for it, has resulted at the school level a huge diversity of ways of teaching, which many teachers find difficult to handle but also has resulted in a very inclusive set of educational programs all over the country, both in the center and the state. Similarly, in higher education, the university system, both center and state, have transformed the country. And even though we see around great problems and poverty, it's also true that there's been a great increase in our middle class. Similarly, in terms of caste and religious inclusiveness, Despite huge tensions which we see all around us, which are critical and important, legally and in many ways socially, we have become much more inclusive a society than we were decades ago. The constant challenges and problems we have are a constant reminder that these inclusiveness and the successes are not something to be taken for granted. And one has to keep, I hesitate to use the word, battling against uh, the decay of systems which are more inclusive. So how did all of this come about? And let me tell you three different components. One is a historical view, not in terms of recent human history, but from the perspective of evolution of all life on this planet, how we as humans came about. In that context, what have we done more recently to ourselves and to the planet? And finally, given these two components, our evolution as living beings on this planet and as those who have changed the planet, what can we now do? So let's take the first example. We don't know how, but several billions of years ago, billions of years ago, all life on this planet originated, let's say, at t equal to zero as, as a first approximation, single cellular organisms. These organisms had a chemistry which allowed them to replicate. And indeed, today, the population of life on this planet is still dominated in terms of mass by a huge number of these single cellular organisms, bacteria and so on. What then happened over hundreds of millions of years is something rather remarkable. And we don't know whether it's happened anywhere else in the universe or in other universes, but this is something very fascinating. These unicellular organisms evolved 
to become some of them multicellular so the groups of cells talk to each other and from them certain kinds of organisms such as what we are more familiar with when we talk about animals insects um, rats mice humans dinosaurs much earlier all of them evolved now it seems extraordinarily remarkable that such complexity could evolve by chance but indeed it is entirely by chance that this com complexity evolved there is no other intervention other than time and chance and a shared chemistry which allowed this the first chemistry which allowed these unicellular organisms to come was again a remarkable very very rare event and then rare events on rare events resulted in the complexity which we see including the complexity which we see amongst us as humans, apes, and so on and so forth. What happened about 65 million years ago, a meteorite crashed on Earth, resulting in huge climatic change, as well as perhaps simultaneously, either caused by that or in some other way, there were massive volcanic eruptions. And these resulted in dinosaurs effectively becoming extinct. So the dominant land animals were wiped out, and that resulted in the growth of mammals uh, dominating the ecosystem. And much, much later, amongst those mammals were our ancestors, our common ancestors with the great apes, from which archaic humans evolved, our predecessors, and then from that, we evolved. We evolved as humans in Africa, and before we migrated out of Africa, archaic humans, such as Neanderthals, migrated out of Africa, and we mated with them and with other archaic humans and populated, they became extinct, and modern humans populated the entire planet. So basically, we are a mixture of not only humans, but of other species, to a very small extent, but we are a mixture. And we have come out of Africa and populated the entire globe. At the early stage of our population was entirely like that of other animals, based on the need to survive. And indeed, like all other animals survived or became extinct, our goal was simply that. But there were two features which made us remarkably different. One was language, and we still don't know how that evolved, but our ability to speak and communicate changed us and made us very, very distinct from other animals. But also simultaneously, if you look at our brain size, our brain size is enormous compared to our body size when you look at other great apes, for example. To sustain this kind of a brain size, we have to be constantly eating, if you were hunter-gatherers, if you were just gatherers, if you were vegetarians, to, we would be constantly eating about 24 hours a day, and even that wouldn't sustain this brain size. But the second invention, the, sec the second change, was an invention, which is the use of fire, the discovery of fire and its use, dramatically changed our food. We could cook food and therefore get substantially huge calorific, uh, calorific input over a short period of time. This allowed inputs for our brain to develop much more disproportionate to the rest of our body. So a brain which allows complexity was an accident of its growth. Language was another accident, but this combination liberated us, as it were, from the shackles of evolution and having to survive to becoming agents of change on this planet. So over a period of time, as we moved from being hunter-gatherers to agriculturists, and then developing tools in that process which could actually make our agriculture much more efficient, we ended up eventually, about a few hundred years ago, some say, or 10,000 years ago is another landmark, 
becoming agents who started interfering with the planet in a big way. The Industrial Revolution is a big example. We started creating machines, extracorporeal machines, which could do things on our behalf and do things on scale. This completely started changing the planet hugely and changing the planet in a way which natural, uh, natural selection never before did. Many species became extinct before, because of us. Large tracts of land were completely transformed into um, urban societies because of us. And our ability to communicate resulted in the transmission of knowledge and abilities to go from generation to generation by cultural means substantially rather than by genetic means alone. So the result of this is we are no longer on one level tied down to our genetic history in terms of what we do. And that has resulted in a dramatic transformation of the planet. So whether we are able to be extraordinarily physically fit or not, we can travel large distances because of transportation, cars, rails, and air available. And whether we understand something specific or we understand something specific and not understand something else, our ability to communicate means that we can be much more uh, productive in abstract ideas as well as practical applications in a manner never before done by history. And of course, as with any ability, this has resulted in extraordinary transformation of our societies, both for the good and for evil, depending on the context in which this has been used. Now in this situation where we have transformed the planet, and by the way, this transformation has now reached a tremendous uh, critical point by the discovery of some scientists about 20 years ago or more, I think, of a hole in the ozone layer and the Antarctic. And that hole was caused by gases which were done, uh, created by us on Earth, chlorofluorocarbons. We realized that we are warming the planet to such an extent that its very existence is a threat. So there's a great urgency for peace, not only for education, but peace for a purpose for saving the planet. Now in this situation, we must keep in mind a fundamental aspect of our biology. And we must also keep in mind another aspect that we have transcended the limits of our biology again and again. So just as we are unable to fly on our own, but we've created airplanes to fly, in a similar manner, all the other so-called intrinsic limitations of our biology should not be seen as intrinsic arguments for not doing something or for doing something, but as features which we must recognize and transcend. So whether it is gender equality or peace or war, there are always arguments given by looking at other species or human history saying that some component is intrinsically biological, but there is no reason now, given that our principal mode of transmission of our ideas is not by genetic means, but by cultural means, there's no reason why we can't transcend those biological barriers. But there's a critical biological barrier which we need to transcend. And it's important to recognize that barrier for us to be able to transfer. And this is an interface which, with biology and philosophy, and because it's an interface between biology and philosophy, it also has a cultural component to it. And that is pretty much the reason why this has to be openly and clearly grasped. And that problem is in the definition of what we are, and that definition by intrinsically requires us to specify what we are not and therefore results in specifying the other. When you say that you have certain values, you recognize that others don't have those values. When you say that you have certain views, you recognize that others don't have those views. And this then becomes a standard challenge in both society and in nature. In nature, the recognition of the other results in effectively 
a war of natural selection. And we as humans have long gone past that stage because the complexity of our nervous system, our language, and our ability to create new structures which have cultural transmission. Yet, we have not lost this definition of us and the other. Whether it is city, state, language, caste, religion, race, and so on, so gender, we always define one and therefore we end up defining the other. The moment we do this, this poses a huge challenge in education about how do you accommodate different kinds of viewpoints, right? If one is open and gives all viewpoints equal access, of course there will be some viewpoints which don't give you the equal access which you give. What do you do in such a situation? That's a complexity. On the other hand, if you close yourself and isolate yourself and say that you're going to have an island of inclusiveness and exclude others who don't share your views into that inclusive island, then you run into other kinds of problems. The Roman Empire, for example, gave citizenships to all those it, it ruled, irrespective of race and so on, but yet it had slaves who were distinctly outside that system. Similarly, the uh, US Constitution guaranteed freedom to everyone without formally acknowledging that slaves uh, also needed that, that freedom for a long time. So it's very easy to have a peaceful environment for a defined set of people and have an educational system which ensures a correct form of peaceful education for a defined set of people. But the moment you start to remove that definition of restriction, you start entering into conflicts of various sort. And this is an intrinsic problem. What is the solution? The mistake we make, and I'll end by this, is to look at perfect solutions for these kinds of complex problems. There never are and never will be perfect solutions, but they'll be very, very workable and very tractable, imperfect solutions. Because the moment you look for a perfect solution, again you're making the mistake, we are all making the mistake, in assuming that our individual viewpoints are the right ones and perfection must follow the acceptance of that viewpoint. But the moment you accept that there are billions of other viewpoints, or at least hundreds or thousands of other viewpoints, then you're forced to look for approximate solutions. So functional solu societies end up in looking at approximate solutions. Approximate solutions create tensions, but approximate solutions can also create solutions. And those kinds of solutions are what our schooling system needs to look at. The last point, which again gives a lot of hope in this situation about how we can have peace in education, is have self-imposed large-scale restrictions on what are the methods of conflict. If we accept that conflict is inevitable, but we also accept that conflict will be resolved by certain means and not by other means, right? Not by restricting the views of others, not by using any violent methods, not by intimidating, not by bullying. Then you can have debates which you can agree to disagree, you can agree to have different sets of viewpoints, but you don't have to become violent about that. But that's again a huge challenge. Socially, in these situations, when we start respecting each other's viewpoints,